Okay, good morning. I'm sorry for my delay. Welcome, everybody. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, page. We started the Maimah of Vush Malchus last week. The first Maimah on Purim. Thursday and Friday, I discussed some of the main points of the Maimah. Because today is Erev Purim. So, I want to go to the last piece, the last piece of this Maimah. on page 181 or Tzadik Aleph, column 2. On top it says Megillus Esther. Uh, page 181, on top it says Megillus Esther. The third paragraph. Ach lohavin mashakasav ayikach hamam. Paragraph before Vizel Inyan Vesus. You see. So just, uh, we learned at length, the previous year at length, the whole idea of Ilova Alul versus Yashmayayan, the Mile of Gashmi. Just a second. <sighs> and uh, the difference between the two that we discussed at length. It all began by discussing the idea that Haman tells a Hashvedish, Yavil Levush Malchus. They should bring the royal garment that the king dressed, dresses in. And they should bring the, the horse that he rides on. And bring the crown that he wears. And place it on the person whom he cherishes. Haman, of course, thinks it's him. It ends up, it ends up to be Mordechai. <coughs> So spiritually, he explains in this Maimah what all these things mean relative to Hashem, the Levush Malchus of Hashem, the Keser, the crown, the horse. And he says, since Purim was a continuation and a culmination of Matan Torah, so everything that happened by Matan Torah happens again on Purim. Like the Megillah says, V'kibulu ha-Yehudim, V'kibulu ha-Yehudim, is what began by Matan Torah was culminated and completed in the times of Mardukhai. This was, a, and then it starts a long explanation, which we only start at the beginning. What levush malchus is? What levush malchus is? Soiv of Kalaman, and what the kesser is, what the crown is, and what the what the sus is, what the horse is, and all these things were being accessed on Purim. So even though Haman, on a literal level, was just wanted these things for himself, but on a spiritual level, there's a deeper story where all these divine energies were being accessed during the time of Purim, and they came to Mardukha. So after a long explanation, he discusses what the garment is, what the Levush Malchus is, and then what the Keser Malchus is, and then what the horse is, what the Sus is. So I want to focus on one Nekud at the end of the Maimon. He says, "Vizel inyan v'sus asherachav alav hamelach." There's the horse that the king rides on, and the idea of a horse. He explains earlier the idea of a horse is that 
a horse is very interesting. <laughs> interesting. I mean, a horse, on one hand, is completely a good horse. Those who know how to ride a horse, and they become very connected to the horse. The horse is completely uh, subservient to the person who rides the horse. And yet the horse takes you to a place that you can't go yourself. Heights and depths and speeds and deserts and terrains. A horse, especially in the ancient world before, techno- <coughs> before we tapped into electricity, you know, the horse was the, one of the primary uh, instruments to use in war and in other situations because the horse has a tremendous power and its power is used just to harness the master where the master wants to go. If the horse feels that the horse rider doesn't know what he's doing, it's a sakana. Because then the horse has to take over. It's for, horses are very sensitive. And apparently they know right away if, you, <laughs> if you're secure, if you're insecure, if you know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing. If you're the Talmud or you're the Rav, the horse knows. And if the horse is put into the position of being the master, it's difficult. But in, the, in a relationship where the master knows where he wants to go, so the horse of the country, the horse tunes in and takes him to a place that he couldn't get on his own. So the Rebbe explains earlier that Susim in Kabbalah and Zoya and other places, Kesir Kaval Susachim HaKvesech Yeshua represents the power of Isis. Isis, letters or words. Like we spoke in a previous shir, on one hand, words... They're, they're external. They just facilitate, like a horse, they facilitate what you want, what, what you want to say. Right? What are the, what's the function of letters and words? They're kalim, they're vessels for ideas or for emotions. That's what they are. They don't have their own... If a person reads words from a language they don't understand, you're reading words. You know, sometimes you're just reading words or you're hearing words. On the other hand, if the words facilitate something deeper then the words bring out the truth of it in a way that the idea itself doesn't do it. Sometimes you see a person has an idea, and then when you talk about it, the words themselves bring out a new depth in it that you didn't have before. The same is true with emotions. The words themselves, like a horse, they bring you to a place that you couldn't get on your own. The words have a certain power. You know. So it, you could think, it's the main thing is the emotion, what's the difference? But it happens to be that words have something in them to the point that they can create something that is much deeper than the original experience of it that was just in your heart. And that's why even though words could sometimes seem very external, and they could be external, they could be hollow, they could be superficial, but nonetheless, when the oasis are reflecting something deep, they can bring you to a place that the experience itself doesn't have. Like in a relationship, sometimes the very words, you say it's, it's just hollow words. Try it, but you'll see that the words themselves have the power of horses. So he says, to access the divine garment of royalty and crown of royalty, there's always the source, this, the horse, the sus, which are called tzirufei isis, combinations of letters. And hamshachas, each letter is a hamshach, is a flow to bring out the gilu ein seif down here, the way it's lamaila in a higher space. All these states. We revealed also by Purim, that's when the Jewish people accepted what they began by Matan Torah. What happened by Matan Torah is the Jewish people said, We will do and we will hear. What's Pshat? It was a state where their Ratzin became completely aligned and one with Hashem's Ratzin. What's the idea of Nasev and Ishma? Nasev and Ishma represents there's absolute trust. I trust you. Usually, yeah, if somebody makes a contract with me and they want me to do things, I have to study the contract. What do you want? Let me see. What are the conditions? What am I gaining? Yeah, how many hours a day? 
What was the Chiddush Ramat and Torah? That after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, after everything the Jewish people saw, they felt, whatever you say, I'm in. The relationship with you is more precious than anything else. I don't have to hear all of the constitution and all of the details and all the 630 mitzvahs. That can only come when there's full trust. Why would a person do that? First here, and then is Nasa. No, they did first Nasa Venishma. The answer, of course, is after they saw Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, they saw the templates, they saw Kriyas Yamsuf, they realized the intensity of the love, and they said, you know, this relationship I can fully trust. That's the concept of Nasa Venishma. I can fully trust. So Nasa Venishma represents a place where the Ratzin becomes one. It's a very, very deep place, because usually we want to protect ourselves. And there's a good reason why we protect ourselves. Because you're afraid. <laughs> you don't want to be used. You don't want to be exploited. You don't want to be manipulated. Yeah. Somebody makes a contract with you. There's no Nasa Venishma. First I'll hear, and then I'll do. If I like it. If I don't like it, I won't do it. You don't sign the contract before that. That's what any lawyer will tell you. <laughs> what are the conditions? You may be paying out of your... <laughs> out of your pocket money that you shouldn't be paying, and it may be a waste of, uh, it may be a, a bracha, the whole thing may be not good for you. But Nasev and Ishma meant that they were a state where there was a bitl ratzen. A bitl ratzen means my ratzen is completely, completely aligned with you. There's a full, full sense of trust. That's what happened by Matan Torah. It didn't just come like this came through the experience of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim and the Ten Makas and everything they saw and the journey that they had till Matan Torah and Kriyas Yamsef. Then they said, if it's you, I'm in. <laughs> I trust. That's, that's, that's a place of real, real trust. Really, really letting go of anything else. You have to be careful with this because if somebody's going to use you that way, then you don't want to say Nasev and Ishma. You can only say Nasev and Ishma if you know <laughs> If you know that the one you're saying it to really, really cares for you as much as you care for yourself, right? That's the insight. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important idea. So he says, The time of Mardachai Esther, there was similarly that relationship where the Jews were ready to completely, completely, they surrendered their souls. Al-Tarebbe says something fascinating. Haman wanted to kill every Jew, but the Jew had to be a Yehudi. What's the Yehudi? The Gemara says in Meseches Megillah, It says in the Megillah about Mordechai, there was a Jew, a Yehudi in Shushan. Ushmai Mardechai ben Yoyi ben Shimi ben Kish Ish Yemini. He was from Shevet ben Yamin. So the Gemara says it's a contradiction. First you call him Ish Yehudi. Naturally Yehudi means he comes from Shevet Yehuda. And then you say he came from Binyamin. So this is a struggle the Gemara has. There's different interpretations. Maybe his father was from one tribe and his mother was from another tribe. It's not so simple. One of the explanations in the Gemara is that he really came from Shevet bin Yamin. But he's called Yehudi not because he was from Shevet Yehuda. Because Yehudi describes the definition of Mardecha. That kala kaifa b'avayda zara. Somebody who denies avayda zara and embraces Hashem is called Yehudi from the word maida. That's what he says. He's kaifa ba'akam and he's maida. He's Yehud, Yehud, the word Yehudi comes from the word haida'a. Haida means you submit, you surrender, you're grateful. Like when Yehuda was born, Leah said, I'm thankful, apam aida. It's from the word Haida. So the word says, somebody who throws away, who rejects Avaida Zara. In other words, any Mitzias, anything outside of Hashem to really call it a Mitzias, a reality, an identity he rejects, and he embraces Hashem, that's the definition of Yehuda. It's the first time in Tanakh that all the Jews are called Yehudim. Till at that point in Tanakh, the Jews are called Yisrael. Or Bnei Yisrael. I'm Bnei Yisrael. The first time they're called Yehudim is in Megillah Sester. It's very interesting. The literal reason is because this was after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. 
and most of the tribes were already exiled, the ten tribes, and many of them assimilated. So the majority, there were Jews from all the tribes, but the majority of them were Yehuda and Binyamin. Those were the two tribes that weren't exiled. But why are the people from Yemen also called Yehudim? And even the other Jews are called Yehudim. So Alter Rebbe says, because the hidden Akud of Yehudi is somebody who is Kaifer Bavaydezada. He rejects Avaydezada. In the Megillah, even the Kayanim and the Levim, which for sure, who for sure didn't come from Shevet Yehuda, they came from Shevet Levi. You can't be a Kayan if you come from Shevet Yehuda. They're also called Yehudim. Because they gave their souls, they surrendered their souls. for Throughout the whole year, they had an opportunity to say, I'm not a Yehudi. And then they would stay alive. This is a big chiddush he's saying here. That Haman wanted to kill the Yehudim. If you would say, I'm not a Yehudi, I'm done, you could, you could survive. Now, it's an important thing to understand about the story. People think that the Purim story happened in 20 minutes, the time it takes to read the Megillah. If somebody reads it in 15 minutes, the story happened in 15 minutes. The story happened over 12 years, and it's a complex story because Achashverosh makes a party. In the third year of his reign, he makes a party, and then he kills Vashti. It takes four years until he finds a new queen, Esther, the seventh year of his reign. And then it takes five years till Haman makes an edict in the twelfth year of his reign. So it didn't happen as a... It took, to watch the story, you had to watch twelve years. And after twelve years, Haman convinced Achashverosh to allow him to kill all the Jews and to choose a date in which every Jew should be killed by anybody who wants to kill the Jews with the full support of the royal palace, of the full weight of the Persian Empire. And that date was Yud Gimel Adr, the 13th of Adr. Today, Yud Gimel Adr. The Xerah came out, Yud Gimel Nisan, the 13th of Nisan, and there would be an 11-month preparation to kill every Jew. So everybody could prepare, they can sharpen their swords, they can get ready, and Jews didn't have where to go to because Achashverosh was a Moshel Bekipa. All the 127 provinces that the Jews lived in, he was in control. They couldn't run to the United States of America. So many ways, the Gzeda in the time of Haman was the worst in history because they were all concentrated under the rule of Achashverosh. There's nowhere to go. There was no other government to go to. The Gemara says he was a Moshel Bekipa. Now, this was Yud Gimel Nisan, so there's 11 months of the decree. Esther makes a fast day for three days. She goes into Achashverosh. It's, the, it's, the, it's Pesach. She has another party. The second day Pesach. That's where there's a lot of wine. She wanted to drink the four cups of wine. And then what happens is at the second party, Achashverosh is drunk, and that's when she accuses Haman of trying to murder her. Haman falls on the bed to ask for compassion. That's when the king goes out to the courtyard and comes back and sees Haman on the bed with Esther. And now he's accusing Haman of wanting to take his wife, and Haman gets killed. But the Xavier was still there. Eleven months later, the Jews would be killed. So now Esther pleads with Achashverosh to send out a second decree, but he never cancels the first decree. People think that put him, he canceled the first decree. He didn't. He said, the first decree I can't cancel because an edict that comes out of the king signed, you can't return, you can't cancel it. All he did was he gave the Jews permission that they can defend themselves. So you have to understand that this wasn't a simple thing, put him, happened, boom. After the decree came out that they could defend themselves, they still have to defend themselves. But everyone who wants to kill Jews has a right to kill Jews, you'd give them other. So that's what al is saying. What did that year look like? That year, that year, from you'd give them this until you'd give them other, it was a very, very intense year. So you would think that some Jews would leave the title Yehudim. They would say, I'm not a Yehudi anymore. And that way, you're done. You're good. You don't go into the realm. You don't go into the dirty, you're not a dirty Jew anymore. So he says, but that's not what happened. All of the Jews remained in the state of Yehudim. That was a state of Mesir Nefesh. Not that they had to die. Mesir Nefesh in the state that they were living in a state of consciousness that they're not going to leave the title of Yehudi. And that's a murder de Canyon. That happened for a whole 11 months. On Yud Gimel Adel Apoyal, there was a war. There had to be a war. And what happened was, the Jews had the confidence and the stamina and the vigor and they inculcated awe and dread and they killed all those who wanted to kill them. And the victory was astounding. 
And then the next day they rested, they relaxed, they celebrated, and that became Purim. In Shushan Purim, in Shushan there were more enemies, there were more people who wanted to kill Jews, the war continued a second day, and the celebration only happened on the third day, Tesvav, that's why Shushan Purim, in Shushan they celebrated on Tesvav. So that's what Al-Tareb is saying, this brought out an Inyan that was similar to Matan Taira. Umachmas Mesidis Nefesh Zu. So all the revelations of Matan Teira, Hashem's royal garment, Hashem's royal crown, Hashem's royal horse, it all came out again on Purim. All the Madregas that he spoke earlier in the Maimer, what the Levush is, what the Keser is, what the Sus is, all came out again on Purim because Purim was the culmination of Matan Teira. But in a way it was deeper. By Matan Teira, it was Nasa Venishma, it was full trust. Bittal Ratzin. In Purim, they were tested with their very identity, and it was a question of life and death, and yet they all remained Yehudim for the whole year. They remained in that place. This is where, this is who I am. This was therefore a Hemshech of Matan Teira. Ach lahavin mashakasa vayikach haman es alavush vesasus me'ayin zacha haman lebchin es halalu. This is a question. But how does this come to Haman? It says Haman is the one who took it. He took the Levush, he took the Sus, and he put it on Mardechai. So I understand the Pnimius of it is that Achashverish refers to Hashem. And all these things got revealed by the Jewish people. But he says, who's the one who brought it out? It was Haman. He says, by Ayin Zacha Haman Lekalpchina Salalu. Where was Haman Zoycha to be the one to retrieve all these things and give it to Mardechai? What's the source of Haman in Torah? Haman in Torah. The answer is Hamin It's a fascinating piece of Gemara in Chulin The Gemara says, "What's the source of Haman in Torah?" Now you have to understand what the question is. What do you mean? What's the source of Haman in Torah? Who says he has a source in Torah? Haman was a Haman, but the Gemara says no. If there's a Haman in the world, there's a Haman in Torah. It's a fascinating idea. If there's a Haman in the world, there's already a Haman in Torah. It doesn't start in the world. It starts in the blueprint. If it's in the house, it's in the blueprint. In this case, we know that the contractor followed, the, not, unlike other houses, where the contractor does what he wants. In this case, the contractor followed the blueprint. So if there's a Haman in the, in the world, there's a Haman in the blueprint. Where's Haman in the blueprint? So the Gemara answers that it says in Parshas Bereshis, after Adam and Chava ate from the tree, Hashem told Adam, Hamin From the tree that I told you not to eat from, you ate? Hamin is He Mem Nun. The same letters like Haman. Now it's strange because Hamin and Haman are two separate things. Haman is a name. Hamin means from, like Hamin. Hamin Hatapuach, like you say, you took from this. Hamin is from Min. So Hamin Ha eats. From the tree that I told you not to eat, you ate? That's the Haman Minatayr. What's the connection? What's the relationship here? So the Rebbe says, Ha'inyin. So here's a fascinating thing. <laughs> we all know where Purim, the Gemara says in Megillah Dav Zayin, Amar Rav, Mechai Yevinish L'Vesum Yevapur Yad Aloyad Abinar Hamal Abarach Mardach. And Purim 1 is supposed to become L'Vesum Yevapur Yad Aloyad Abinar Hamal Abarach Mardach. To become lebedic, intoxicated, inebriated through wine until you don't know the difference between cursed as Haman and Baruch Mardachai. Where did they get this idea? Ada lo yada, there should be no yada. No yada. The emesis, where's Haman and Torah? Haman and Torah is Hamin ha'etz, from the tree that I told you not to eat yet. What was the name of this tree? Eitz Adas. <laughs> the Eitz Adas. So the Rebbe said, if Haman is rooted in the Eitz Hadas, so what's the avoid of Purim? Adelayada. <laughs> Adelayada, but it doesn't mean to lose your mind that you become a sugar. You become a wild uh, anarchist who's out of control. Eitz Hadas, I mean, Layada means you can go, you go deeper than Eitz Hadas. That's the word. It says, in the Ksivnations, Goyim Amalek. Bilam says in Parshas Balak, Bilam in his prophecy says, Reish is Goyim Amalek. The genesis, the beginning of the nations is Amalek. Shekol oevdi kechav me mebchines eitz adas toi vera v'amalek hula maile mehen. Reish is Goyim Amalek means there's something in Amalek that's the beginning of all of the Goyim, of all of the nations. Reish is Goyim Amalek v'acharisi yedad ayeven. 
You have many nations, and you had many nations that were entrenched in pagan idolatry. But Amalek is the beginning. He's Lamaila man. He's like the source, the progenitor. Reish is Goyim Amalek. So he says, all the Avedis Hechavim is rooted in Eitz Hadas Tevera, but Amalek is still higher. V'zehu Hamin Ha'etz, Bitmiya, Sho Lamaila Mabchina Sa'etz. Hamin Ha'etz, Haman, he doesn't say, you're from the tree. You're from the tree? You're higher than the tree. You're the source of the tree. Reish is Goyim Amalek. All, he says, the nations that were pagan, are rooted in Eitz Hadas. Haman, Hamin Ha'etz Hazeh. You're from this tree. You're higher even than the Eitz Hadas. In other words, you're deeper. You're deeper than the Eitz Hadas. L'may l'am chinesetz. Um ikal makay. Me'achar d'ksiv hamina eitz. Afilu b'loshen t'miya. Hada yesh l'ya kol panam t'as shaykhes ala eitz. Shem l'ikein l'ama maskira eitz ala eitz. The very fact that you're asking, you're from this tree, means that he has a connection to the tree. Because if not, why does he mention him with the tree? If he's completely not connected to the Eitz Hadas, he's completely of a different realm, then it's not even a question. The very fact you ask a question already means there's a relationship. The, the question is, is this all there is? You're more than this. You come from a place that precedes the Eitz Hadas. But some, some shaykhs there is. So what does this all mean? He says, Acha'inyin shu b'bchinnas makif la'etz. Negeya ve'ene negeya. Haman is connected to the Eitz Hadas. But it's called, he's a makif to the Eitz. What does it mean a makif to the Eitz? He's connected to the Eitz. Negeya, he touches it. Ve'ene negeya. Doesn't touch it fully. In other words, there's a connection there. And that's why you say, Hamin ha'etz. Asher tzivisicha. Haman is that Hamin. But yet, he's not fully the Eitz. Negeya ve'ene negeya. He touches it and doesn't touch it. It's an expression in Kabbalah, mati ve'loi mati. It says about a nesher, an eagle, when it comes to the nest, al goizolov yirachef. It hovers over the goizolim, the, the chicks. Because if it comes straight into the nest, it's too big and overwhelming. It can scare them, it can hurt them, it can kill them. So it hovers over them and says, ene negeya. It touches the nest, but it doesn't touch. You have to be able to know how to touch without touching. <laughs> without touching. It's like a contact that's subtle. So he uses these words with Haman and the Eitz Hadas. He's negei of any negei. What does all this mean? Because Haman represents the ultimate of chutzpah and gasas aruach, which means arrogance. And because of this, Haman is connected to the Eitz Hadas, but in a way, it's the source of the Eitz Hadas. It's higher. It's it's it's. It's the Reish's Goyim. It's the beginning of the Eitz Hadas. It's like the source. It's the progenitor of Eitz Hadas. And that's the idea of Chutzpah and Gasa Saruch. And he explains. <clears throat> What's the idea of Chutzpah and Gasa Saruch? What's the idea of Chutzpah? When you say Chutzpah, <laughs> we use the word Chutzpah a lot. Some of us were raised a lot with the word Chutzpah. Yeah? Chutzpah. Pistam Chutzpah. But what's the real Nekud of Chutzpah and Gasa Saruch? Sometimes a person argues with you. It makes sense what they're saying. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but there's an argument. That's not called chutzpah. <laughs> I know sometimes it's called chutzpah when somebody has a different opinion, but that's not called chutzpah. That means there's different opinions. There's different perspectives. That's not chutzpah. Right? If somebody, if, uh, if somebody is in a relationship and somebody has an opinion and somebody challenges their opinion, you don't say it's chutzpah. Why is it chutzpah? If a teacher is teaching a class and a student asks a good question on the idea, you don't say it's chutzpah, it's not chutzpah. Huh? <laughs> I hear you. You're saying any question is a chutzpah. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, I'm not Japan, Japanese, I don't know. Huh? Depends. I mean, it's lav davke chutzpah. If somebody's trying to understand something, that's not chutzpah. That's a, that's, that could be, that could, on the contrary, how could you communicate if a person can't... Uh, that's why Japanese have in every company. They have a gringo, American. So he can argue. An American can argue. Yeah. I hear? Yeah. So that could be a different Indian. When you have the seven nations, Kanani, the seven, Sheva Umas, right? Kanani, Chiti, Amoyri, Prizi, Chivi, Yivusi, Gergoshi. So that it says in Demi Maimonim that they represent the seven Midas. Chesed, Gvurah, Tiferes, Netzach, Yisaid, Malchus. Each one of the Midas yeah, 
it has its perspective. It has its experience of life. It may be based on a cover-up. It may be based on a blockage. The idea of chutzpah is something else. The idea of chutzpah and gasa saruach is, it's chutzpah l'shem chutzpah. It's a whole different Indian. It's not based on a certain quality. It's, the reason there's a chutzpah is because there could be a chutzpah. In other words, it's not based on a search for truth. It's simply oppositional, just because I could be oppositional. That's a whole different Indian. That's what Gasa Saruach means. Gasa Saruach means it's coming from pure arrogance. It's not, I have a way of looking at it. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. That's what Haman represents. That's what Amalek represents. Ashikar Chabadarach. All the other enemies that the Jewish people had, they were scared of the Jewish people for unjustified reasons. But in their mind, there was a threat. Marshal Parai was threatened by the Jewish people because he saw how their numbers were growing and he felt they're going to take over the country. He was wrong. They didn't want to take over the country. They didn't want to defeat him. They didn't want to uh, destroy the country. They didn't want to kill Parai. But that was his afraid. Other countries, they were afraid the Jewish people are going to take their territory. Why was Amalek? What was Amalek? What was bothering Amalek? Because by Yahweh Amalek, the first war of Amalek against the Jewish people, they didn't come through his territory. They weren't going by his territory. Yeah. They weren't competing over territory. They didn't even live in the same proximity. Amalek came from his country to fight the Jewish people. Something about the Jew that just bothered him. If you exist, I can't exist. This is a different type of a war. If there's a war, I hate you because I perceive you as my enemy and therefore I have to hate you, we could talk and I'll show you you're not my enemy. When it's something at the core, there's something about you, it's not, it's, it's not a rational hatred. And it's a different type of hatred. There's rational hatred, there's irrational hatred. Rational hatred you could negotiate. Irrational hatred, I don't even know why I, I, don't even know why I hate you. <laughs> you as you, you exist, you trigger me in some way. We'll soon see there's a, there's a reason, for, there's a different type of reason. So now you have to be very, very careful with this hate because it has no cure. Because if it's based on a fear that you're going to take away something from me, in other words, there's a rational you saw it, even though you're making a mistake. But I could talk and I could show you that I'm not your enemy. But if it's not based on a rational you saw it, it's not based on a rational foundation, that your very existence threatens my very existence so all appeasement in the world won't help why won't it help because as long as you're here i'm not happy and therefore it's not based on any aside it's not based on some rationality that we could disagree with that's the difference the other nations they represent different middas they're threatened in different ways a malik is pure chutzpah vegasas haruch this is pure chutzpah what's pure chutzpah not that i disagree with you because I have a different opinion. I have nothing to say. But the chutzpah is coming out. The core, core audacity that's not based on a reality. That's where the word chutzpah belongs. That's pure, pure arrogance. Somehow your existence undermines my existence. And this is a very difficult hatred to deal with. That's why Malcham Hashem Ba Malik Midar Dar. Jews have had enemies who you could talk to. But then there's a certain type of enemy there's nothing to talk to. As long as you're here, I'm not going to be at peace. There's nothing. You're not threatening me. You're not taking over my country. I don't really think you're taking my money. I may say that in order to justify it to the world. But essentially, your existence drives me crazy. Jews don't know about this type of hatred. That's the problem. That's why they have to be so careful with Amalek. Because when you come to a, a hatred of Amalek, it's a different type of hatred. So he says, Azay. V'hine lo'um yesh b'gdusha. Everything that exists in the world has also exists in Kedusha. For who? V'nikra gamkin p'chines haman l'achir abirur. In Kedusha you have something called haman, but it's holy. It's after the bitter. Ki mebnei banov shal haman lamdu toida berab. The Gemara says that the descendants of haman learned toida berab. In the Masechah Sanhedrin, Mibnei banav shalhaman lamdu toida berabim. Bibnei brak, the Gemara says. In Bnei brak, there were descendants of Haman who learned toida berab. What does this mean? This means that Al Terebbe says that there's an akud of Haman that can come into to, to Yiddishkeit too. Lamdu toida berab. 
הרי שיש בחינת המון לאחר הבידור שנכלו בקדושה. There's a נקוד of המון, after המון is refined, that can go into קדושה. להלכה, on a מלאקי who converts to Judaism, according to many shittas, you can accept them. I, it says to wipe out a מלאק, but if a מלאק wants to convert, there's many shittas, they're not. Here you see, there could be מבני בן of של המון who learned Torah. What's the idea? What's the idea of Haman and Kedusha? The Pasuk says his heart is Vayigba, his heart is, is uplifted. Bedarki Hashem in the ways of Hashem. Kamayim and Azal. Like the Gemara says, When a person davens, one's eyes should look downward, but one's heart should soar upwards. Einayim lamata, but Vilibay lamayla. Einayim him chines chachme kayachma, chines maisha. Eyes represent the ability to see. That's Chachma. Chachma is compared to seeing. Bina is compared to hearing. Chachma is Kayach Ma Moshe, who is the most humble of all people, state of Bittel. Einayim Lamata. Upchines Halev Tzorichlius Lamaila. Shesham Yisaid HaEish VaHatzimoyin VeTeva Eish Lagbiyav Alalus Lamaila. In the heart, you have the fire and the thirst, and fire always wants to rise upwards. There's the element of my eyes, Chachma. Chachma creates a state of complete bittel, ain of lamata. Viliboy, the heart, the thirst, the fire, is lamaila. And a person needs both. Why? If a person doesn't have that sense of agba, which Haman represents that arrogance, but here we're talking about Haman in Kedusha. What's Haman and Kedusha? A sense of exaltedness, a sense of, of sublimity. His heart will not feel the sweetness and the motivation to even begin Avayda Sashem. But Amre, he might say, Who am I? And what is my Avayda Sashem worth? A person must have a heart that's exalted and feels desire. Desire you can only feel if you feel that you deserve to have desire. There's an I that deserves to have desire. Therefore, I'm thirsty. So you hear what the Al-Tareb is saying here. That in Avaidus Hashem, a person needs to have a sense of inner confidence. And this is what he calls Haman La'akhir Habirur. It's, it's, it's an inner sense that I exist and that I am worth something. And my avoid is valuable. Because one of the biggest dangers of avoid Hashem's is what's called a fake bittel. Fake bittel is, me ani, who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. O ma avaydasi, what's my avoid worth? And what does that feed? That feeds the person just going into a sense of carelessness or laziness or despondency or depression. And you could think it's holy. He says, you must have this. Person needs to have this element. In Haman, in Klippe, it's chutzpah, it's gasa saruch, it's arrogance. In Birud, in Kedusha, it's a sense of I matter. Why do I matter? No, 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 no. Now you're already giving, now you're going to the wrong place. Just like Haman in Klippe. Why you chutzpah dick? I don't need a reason. I don't have a reason to explain. I don't have a way of arguing with you. If you have a different opinion, it's not chutzpah. What's chutzpah? I don't have a different opinion. Chutzpah is just to fight. It's a toxic I matter. The I loses all proportions of anything. You're just fighting for the sake of fighting. It's hatred for the sake of hatred. It's gasa saruch. I'm not challenging you on the grounds of anything that makes sense. What am I challenging you based on? Pure arrogance. Says the Alter Rebbe, you have that in Kedusha, in a good way. What is that? A sense of I matter. So you say, explain to me why you matter. <laughs> That's already, uh, explain to me, because I'll prove to you that you don't matter. This is the inner mental chatter people go through. I matter, I don't matter, I matter, I don't matter, I matter, I don't matter. You try proving to yourself rationally that you have a value. If you're trying to prove it to yourself, it means at the core I don't have. And therefore I have to always prove it to myself and explain it to myself. So what's Haman and Kedusha? Haman and Kedusha is a person feels that they matter. And there are void matters.
That's chutzpah v'gasa saruach, the way it's sublimated in holiness. Huh? Yeah, and then there's a tzimoyin, there's a thirst. I want something. I have a chukah. There's a value. My, my desires mean something. I have a thirst. I want a better life. I want a deeper life. I want a real life. If I don't matter, so then the whole chukah doesn't exist. Your wants are nothing. You don't take them seriously. You're not allowed to take them seriously. Your tzimoyin means nothing. Thirsty. Who are you to be thirsty? Anayim avoid You have to be careful. When do you know if Haman comes from Klippa? Or does a Haman, Mibnei Banov Shal Haman Lam Dutayra Ber Abim? That's the Pshat Liboy Lamaila. Liboy Lamaila means your heart is above. Einayim Lamata, my eyes look down. But Liboy, his heart is Lamaila. It feels sublimated, it feels exalted. Vayigbe Liboy Bedarke Hashem. In the Dark Hashem, you have to have Hagba Salev, an uplifted heart. Like Dovid Amelech says, Veshalcha Birichava. I walked with expansiveness. I could speak in front of kings without shame. This comes from It's an exaltedness. We don't call it chutzpah in a negative sense. We call it in a positive sense. A person feels their infinite value. They feel that not miyani does. It's not miyani. On the contrary, they have to feel that the ani is meaningful. When that's missing, he says, the person won't even begin avoid. He won't begin. Because if I'm a shmata, if I'm a loser, if I'm a nobody, what, 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 what's there to begin? <laughs> I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting God's time. I'm wasting everybody's time. But vigam pchines enayim lamata. A person needs both. They need the eyes to be able to go downward. What does that mean? Liyos pchines bittel mamish ba'odin seif baruchu b'amshachas chachmeila koyachma be'esek atayde da'iraisa mechach menafkes v'kmashikasa v'dvari ashasam te beficha. A person needs to live in both places, and the two are not a contradiction. There's ein of lamata, v'liboy lamayla. Ein of lamata means the person lives in the presence of awe, of humility. A person has a bittel to the ein soif, and that's what Torah is all about. Dvari asher samti b'fich, a real learning Torah is that you become a conduit for Hashem's words, and not an ego maniac who separates, who becomes a mechitza, a chatzitza. That's the begin of Moshe v'nachnu ma. That's chachma. That's why Moshe is on of Moed Mikol Adam Hashem al Pnei Hadama, completely open. In that sense, there's no eye. Why is there no eye? Because the eye is a conduit for the Ein Sof. But he says, but how do you begin Avoida? If you begin Avoida by telling somebody you're nothing, so that's what they end up with. So there has to be an element of liboy lamaila. I have a desire. I have a thirst. I'm allowed to have a desire. I'm allowed to have a thirst. That thirst brings you to great places. You're thirsty for something more. You want something. You take it seriously. If I'm not allowed to trust my heart, if I'm not allowed to have an emotion, if I'm not allowed to have a thirst, I can't take anything seriously. I can't take myself seriously. So here he's describing that bittle itself can become very toxic. It's what I spoke in the other shear. When you learn bittle from the lens of brokenness, the bittel could become very broken because bittel could just fit into a story of worthlessness, of self-shame. It has nothing to do with bittel. It has to do with a story, an internal story where the person doesn't feel that they exist. They don't have a right to exist. And then comes bittel and says, oh, perfect. <laughs> now my trauma is theologically justified. <laughs> you understand? Everything is, becomes through that lens. And it's a very, very dangerous place to be. Because at the surface, I'm serving God. You're not, I'm not serving God, I'm serving the devil. The devil of complete sense of worthlessness, which takes away a person from all avoida. That's why the Gemara says, when you daven, you need ein of lamato v'liboy lamayla. Because the sense of, of value, of significance, is the beginning of the journey. The end of the journey is bittel. But what type of bittel? 
Bittal is the Dani becomes Ayin. So it's deeper. Not Bittal, the Dani is such a Shmata, how do you even dare to get close to this? That's already a toxic form. So the person needs to have both. On the other hand, if you just say, oh, I matter, I have value, then it becomes a Narish, a Narish Yeshus. And then I remain stuck in my, in my little orbit. Whatever I want, I want, I want. And then it can even go over to chutzpah and gasa saruach. The person just becomes arrogant. They don't have the, the openness to be able to look for koyach ma, for the ein seif. So these are the two elements. He says a person needs to be kalul mishneim. A person needs to have both. Ein of lamata v'liber lamailo. V'zau inyan sh'a tamad chacham tzadach liyaz b'y shminas sh'bishminas. The Gemara says in Saita that a Talmud Chacham needs to have a Shminis Shabbat Shminis, an eighth of an eighth of arrogance. <laughs> in other words, the Gemara says that humility is very important, but a Talmud Chacham needs a Shminis Shabbat Shminis, which means like a little dosage, a little dosage of, uh, of, 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 of Gaiva. So he says as follows. Kihine, Bibchinis Chachma, Yeshlamid Beis, Nesivis Achachma. It says in Sefi Yitzira, that there's Lamed Beis, there's 32 pathways of Chachma. V'gam Lamed Beis, V'gamatriya Lev. I'm sorry, V'gam Lev, V'gamatriya Lamed Beis. Of course, the heart is also Lamed Beis. U'klolus shneim oila samach So 32 and 32 is 64, that's samach dalet. U'shminis shebeshminis, what's an eighth of an eighth? Who chelik echad misamach dalad? It's one part of sixty-four. <laughs> so that's the pshat. They didn't just say shminis and shminis, throwing out a number, an eighth of an eighth, meaning it could have said a seventh of a seventh, a ninth of a ninth. Shminis and shminis is bediuk. If you divide it, if you divide, so to speak, gaiva into eight parts, and then you have a shminis shabish shminis, an eighth of an eighth, you have one part of samach dalad. Of 64. It's like you divide Gaiva into 64 pieces and you take one fraction of that. No more. If you take a little more, then it's Samach Gimel. Samach Gimel is gas. That's already Nishgut. Gas. Samach Dalit is fine. Samach Dalit is twice slave. Lamed Beis Nesivis Chachma and Lamed Beis the heart. What's the connection? So he says, Vahainu Hagba Salev Hamachuber El Moyacha Chachma. 64 is the number. You need the heart that's connected to the Lamed Beis Nesivis Chachma. Agba Salev, an exalted heart, an uplifted heart, an uplifted identity, but one that's connected always to the 32 pathways of Chachma, which is Kayachma. Ki Ikir hu Chachma hamshachas b'chines habitl. Because ultimately the Ikir is the Bittl, which is Chachma. El shetzricha Allah atchile b'chines hagba Salev. But first I need to have an uplifted heart. To bring down the Chachma. If there's no Hala, if I'm not lifting myself up, I don't access the flow. If I just, I, I die in utero, I put myself down, there's no Hamshacha of Bittal. Bittal is a gift. Bittal is openness to infinity. It's a flow. Bittal is a deeper gift than the lave. So, it's a relationship. This upliftedness, this is called Hisnasus of Kedusha. Exaltedness of holiness. This is Haman after the Birur. The source in the divine light is called Levush, a garment and a horse. The garment is what we say in Tehillim. Hashem, Malach, Hashem was a king, is a king. He puts on the garment of exaltedness. Geus lovish, Pchinis Geus Vesnasus. So, what does it mean by a person? You have to put on a lavush of Geus. The word Geus is like Gaiva, exaltedness. But this is not a bad Geus. This is you have to feel your Malach. Your a melech puts on royal garments. If I'm, a, if, I'm a, if I'm a creep, if I'm a smelly creep, I'm not going to put on geus lavish. So geus lavish is a lavush of exaltedness. Vesus begematria, beis pa'amim samach gimel. And the sus 
is of course Samach Vav Samach. So you have 60 and 60. Samach Vav, 66 plus another 60. So it's 126. That's twice Samach Gimel. So he says, this is the way Haman comes into the bitter. So that's why Haman was Zoycha to take the Levush and take the Sus. Why was Haman Zoycha to take the Levush and the Sus? Again, we're talking about the spiritual story. There's Haman the way Haman is down here. That's Chutzpah and Gasa Saruach. So now let's, let's, let's understand what this means. When a person says, I matter, where does that come from? The sense that I matter, I have real value, right? He's saying it's the Pchin of Haman. So you can understand it from the negative and then you understand it in the positive. When Haman has chutzpah, the, the, the evil Haman, Amalek, has chutzpah, where does it come from? The answer is it doesn't have an explanation. Chutzpah means I'm not attacking you because of an explanation. I'm attacking you because I could. Because your very existence threatens me. It's not a rational thing. It comes from a place that is at the core of my being. And therefore it's so dangerous. Reish is goyim Amalek. You have eight tzadahs. Eitz Adas, at least, is an explanation of Das. He says, Amalek is the source. It's deeper. It's the source of Eitz Adas. Hamina Eitz Adas. Later it comes into Das. Later I'll already have explanations why I hate you. But the bottom line is, I can't stand you. And that's very, very dangerous because it comes from pure chutzpah and gasa saruch. It's arrogance. There's no rationality. I can't even talk to this person. What is that in holiness? He says, a sense that I matter. Why is that equivalent? Because the sense of I matter is also not coming from explanations. If you're giving explanations why you matter, why you're significant, then the person doesn't really matter. There's a certain sense of inner attachment, of an inner sense of connection and value. It's not al-piseichel. And the brokenness of that is not al-piseichel. It's unconditional. Huh? unconditional. It's unconditional. You can have a person who's brilliantly talented, but he doesn't have this. Deep down he feels that he doesn't have any value. He's talented, he makes a lot of money, but all his life he's looking for validation. Somebody to prove to me that I exist. It's a terrible tragedy. And you have another person, in terms of talents and creativity, it can be very simple, but you know what? <laughs> he feels that he matters. And you'll see the difference of their lives. It's completely different. One person has his little life and it's a friend. He, you know, he fixes his doorknob and he's dancing. He mows his lawn and he has menuchas anafash. And the other person, yeah, has everything. Kol in the alma is traveling the world, yeah, has people bowing down, but doesn't have a second of menuchas anafash. Why? Because all the validation can't fill the void. And what's the void? The void is that deep, deep, deep down at his core, he doesn't really exist. So the chutzpah and the gas of saruach, it's the zela umazeh of that. Either at my core, there's an element of agba salev in a good way. You don't say mi ani, mi anoichi, I'm nothing, my avoid is worthless, everything is worthless. And this is a very, very deep voice. This is a very, very deep voice. And very often the chutzpah is a result of that. The chutzpah and the gas of saruach, it's the frustration of that. But in Kedusha, Therefore, what is it? It's a sense that I matter. And it's not conditional. It's not because I had a good day. Some people, if I got a compliment today, it means today I matter. Tomorrow, I make a mistake, so I get criticism. It's an I, I don't matter. So even when I do matter, I don't matter, because it's all conditional. Haman teaches you, you need a little chutzpah. <laughs> it's unconditional, you don't, need, you don't need explanation. That comes from a certain sense of inner attachment, inner connection. Yeah, it's sometimes very early on in life. That's when it happens. If you felt value, you felt that you have absolute value, or you felt that you have really no, no value. And then you have to create fake value, validation, people to love me, people to feel I'm important, whatever it is, distractions. Maybe I become a people's pleaser. Why do I become a people's pleaser? Um. There was a boy, there was a young, a young man once told me many years ago, he's been through a lot of uh, very difficult situations in his life. And he kept on going back into those situations, even as an adult. So I asked him why, if he knows why. 
So he says, yeah, I know why. He says, you have to understand that my, for my brain, the only way I have value in life is if people step on me. If I could be stepped on, it means I have value. At least you're a, you're a rug. A rug has value, right? You come from outside, it's snowing, it's raining, you step on the rug. I'm a chaya. He says, when you step on me, it means I serve a purpose. If you don't step on me, what are you going to do with the rug? You'll hang it up on the Aron Kodesh? Uh, you know. At least you're stepping on me, I have a, a tachlis in life. But it's not a rational thing. It's not like I come to this conclusion. It's very, very deep. So the al says, Haman can exist in Klippa, Haman can also exist in Kedusha. And in Kedusha, it's a certain sense of I that's at the core, the beginning of Avoida. Just like Reish is Goyim Amalek in negativity, in, the, in Avoida also, it's the beginning of Avoida. The beginning of Avoida is Hakba Salev, Ayik Belibe Yeah? What's Nachas Ruach? What do we actually give Hashem? What's Nachas Ruach to Hashem, the Amitzvot? What do we actually give Hashem? Well, Hashem in His infinity decided to do this whole project called creation. So apparently there's something very deep that He wants, that he wants in this connection. Right? It's, it's a very subtle thing. The distinction is a very, very subtle one. Now the Alter Rebbe says, together with this, you need a, a Nayim Lamata. A person's vision because it, again, as I said, it could become very like immature, it, not immature. It could become a it could become a person who just gets stuck over there. The real I, the real I searches for that which is beyond the I. The real I searches for the relationship with the Ain Saif. That's the Enayim 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 Lamaila. Enayim Lamata Valiba Lamaila. So he says, now we come to the punchline here. When Haman initially told Achashvedesh to dress up this guy, he says, bring the garment, bring the horse, and bring the crown. At the end of the story, there's no crown. Haman gives the... Vayikach Haman is asus, but it's not the keser. Haman never gets access to the keser. The king doesn't give him the keser. He asked for it, but he never got access to it. So al says, here's the record. Haman can get the levush. What's the levush? Hashem Malach Geus Lavesh. It's a sense of exaltedness. Hamans gets the sus. The sus is two times. Samach Gimel, gas. Because we have gasus of Kedusha. Gas means arrogant. Gas Aruach. But we're learning here that there's a gasus of Kedusha. A sense of self. A sense of self is not evil. A sense of self is Kedusha. Mashenkin Pchines Keser Malchus. The Keser of Malchus, not the Levush, the crown of Malchus. This it says Shleim HaMelech gets from his mother. In Haman, you don't have the crown. Everything is Zela Umaza Aselekim. Right? It says that Klippa is like a, a, a monkey copying a person. So whatever exists in Kedusha exists in Klippa. Zela Umaza. There's always Pchira. This confidence in Kedusha, there's going to be fake confidence in Klippa. It's going to be fake, but it's going to, it's going to be like a, 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 a monkey copying you. You know, Because in order for there to be Pchira, Hashem made that whatever exists in Kedusha can exist in Klippa. You have wisdom here, you have wisdom here. You have love here, you have love there. One love is real and one love is counterfeit, but it looks the same. You have joy here, you have what looks like joy here. Everything... Is, Haman also, there's chutzpah in, in Klippa, there's chutzpah in Kedusha. There's isnasos, exaltedness, arrogance in Klippa, there's isnasos in Kedusha, like we learned before. He says, but then there's a keser. The keser doesn't exist, zelo umaza. It doesn't exist on the other side. Elo huibchines bitol rotzen mamish nase koidem lanishma. The keser, the crown, this Haman doesn't have. This is the nekud of achdos mamish, of complete oneness. In Haman, ultimately, in Klippa, they can have all the things of Kedusha that have value, so you copy it. But the Nekuda of the Bittal Mamash, the Oneness Mamash with the Lakus, the Nasa Kaidim Lanishma, that's what Keser Malchus represents. 
the crown of Malchus, which is the king himself, it's like in the chessboard. <laughs> in the chess, you know, you have the, the black side and the white side. It's two teams. And everybody has everything, right? Everybody has everything. And, uh, <laughs> and then there's checkmate. What's checkmate? Checkmate is that the other king is defeated and you're left with one king. Now, when you go through the board, you go to the other side, you can get back pieces, right? If you're pawn, if you play chess, you go to the other side, you can get back everything. You can't get back. <laughs> you can get back. You could, and the pawn, the pawn could become a castle, it could become a horse, it could become a bishop, it could become even a queen, but not the king. So he says, the Indian of Keser Malchus, that Haman doesn't have access to. Even Haman Laacher Habirur. Everything else, you have Haman on both sides. So Haman can get you the Lesus, Haman gets you the Levush. But in the Kudah of Keser, that's the Bittal Mamish, that's the experience of Kedusha in its core, in its purity, this you don't have Zela Umaza. Because you don't have Zela Umaza, so therefore Haman can't access it. Zela Umaza you have in things. In the Nekudas Ha'achtos, in the Nekudas Ha'bitl, that clipper can't do. Why? Because that is defined by oneness, and that's not clipper. Anything that's a description of something, confidence, there could be real confidence and fake confidence. There could be real wisdom and fake wisdom. There could be real love and fake love. There could be real relationships and fake relationships. But in the Nekuda of Achtus Mamish, of Bittal Mamish, over there, clipper doesn't have anything. <laughs> How do, how do you fake it? <laughs> this Nekudah you can't fake. And therefore, Haman accesses all these in Yonim. Haman after the bitter. He asked, how is Haman Zoycha to all these things? And the answer is because there's Haman in Kedusha. Kivayachal. Haman min hatayra. Minayin. Hamina eitz hadas. It's higher than the das. Das is the way it becomes rational. And this is at the core. Either it could be chutzpah at the core. Or there could be confidence at the core. So Haman can access the sus and the levush. But the keser, that Haman doesn't access. Because that's the Nekudas Habitl of Nasa Kaidam Lanishma, where there's complete oneness, where already the arrogance of Haman, even in Kedusha, this is already not Zelo Mazet. This doesn't exist in the world of Haman. Because whatever exists in the world of Haman is going to be Zelo Mazet. And this is, this is already beyond Lo Mazet. This is the way once confidence becomes completely one with the Ein Soif. This is no Zalomaz. And he finishes Vidal, which means Vidal Maven. This will be enough for somebody who understands. Uh? Uh? What did you say? The, sh the Shminis Shabashminis is because one is connected to the other. Because if a person really matters, so then the person feels their value. If a person feels their value, then they're thirsty. They have a desire to be able to truly live the best life possible. So if they want to live the best life possible, they want to connect with that which is real. And the only way you can connect with that which is real is bittel. So Bamela, when a person really has a sense of desire and thirst that's coming from, let's call it a healthy ego, I'm going to reach a place of Chachma. I look to find what is the MS? What is the Pnimius? So that's why it works together. That's why he says you have Liboy Lamaila, Veinayim Lamata. And that's Shminis Shibish Shminis of Atamat Chacham. A Talmud Chachem is your Talmud of Chachma. Chachma is Bittl, but he needs an eighth of an eighth. An eighth of an eighth is a 64. Echad Misamach Dalet. That's 32 and 32 twice. Because you have Lamed Beis and the Sivis Chachma, and you have the heart, the emotions, the lave. One of Samach Dalet means the two come together, this slave and this slave. In other words, you have to connect one to the other. When you connect one to the other, you have 64. So that the real Talmud Chachem has Shminis Shabashminis. So there's a very, very delicate balance between self-worth and self-value, but not in a way that leads to 
arrogance and chutzpah negativity. On the contrary, in a way that re- leads to real humility. In other words, somebody, in very practical terms it means, somebody who has a, a very deep and healthy self-esteem, they really know how to be there for somebody else. They, could, they also know how to surrender. They also know how to submit. Because it's not so dangerous. It's not so dangerous. When a person has an inner sense of an inner core, they could really listen to somebody. They could be in a relationship with somebody. Because there's, a sol- there's, there's something solid there. You understand what I'm saying? There's something wholesome. I can create space for you. When I'm an act of trauma of just trying to survive, all, 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 all I'm busy is I'm holding on to, it's like somebody choking me the whole time. I'm just trying to survive. I can't even be fully present in a relationship. To be fully present in a relationship, it's like a person doesn't have ear, right? Chas shalom. a person is choking. I say, I want to talk to you about my needs. <laughs> I want to connect to you. <laughs> The fire burning, sebrenta fire. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, 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 to cope. And sometimes that's what a person is doing. They're in an active place of just trying to cope. Pasha trying to cope. The first path to healing this is acknowledging it. When a person can really, really acknowledge it and see, this is where my brain goes, right? Either I have to run, or I have to freeze, or I have to fight. They call it, you know, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or I become a people's pleaser, which means the ultimate shmata. This is where I have to keep on going. Why do I have to keep on going here? Because there is like this worm, this, this spiritual cancer, this emotional cancer that push it, eats up everything by the person. It's a very, very tragic state. And that's really where chutzpah and gasas aruach comes. I have nothing. All I have is chutzpah which is a fake way of saying I exist. For Haraya, the definition of my existence is that you don't exist. That's the only definition of my existence. Every day I have another enemy. And that's why people who live this way, it's very hard for them to be in a relationship. Because everybody that comes close to them becomes their enemy because you're threatening me. When there is a real sense of value, in a, in a sense, he says, Haman in Kedusha, Vayik Balibi B'Darki Hashem, then... The person has a certain, there's a core, there's a stability, I can actually listen, I can grow, I can hear critique, I can be in a relationship. You, you, you guys understand what I'm saying? Huh? Huh? You don't understand what I'm saying? You see it, Maisen Bechal Yoim. You could be in a, a, a relationship, means you have to hear somebody, you have to be able to give and take. If I'm always threatened, so then you're always the enemy. I, if there's a fire alarm, you ever heard a fire alarm going off? And if that phylum is in my brain 24 hours a day because my existence is threatened, I don't have space for anything else. I'm just trying to deal with my fire alarm. And most of my cravings are just to distract me from my fire. I don't even want things. It's interesting what Alter Rebbe says here. To have a tzimoyin and a chukah, you have to have a sense of self. I, people want, they don't, you don't really want it. You're just looking for distractions. That's not called wanting. It's called numbing. Now I have a phone. Now I have an addiction. Now I have a drink. Now I have money. I'm not, I, you're not, you don't want anything. You're not thirsty for something. You're, all, you're thirsty maybe for, like, for, 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 for alcohol. But you're not really thirsty for something. All you want is distraction, 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 distraction. It's pain. It's a reaction to pain. A chukun, a tzimoyin means it's not pain. It's a thirst. I'm a yearning. I have a yearning. I want to be close. It's a whole different union of chukun and tzimoyin. To really have a thirst and a yearning, yeah, you have to be able to have a sense of self that is justified and wants to have a chukka and a tzimoyen. This is what I want. And he says it's a beautiful thing, it's a good thing. The fascinating thing is that it's still called Haman. It's Haman of Kedusha, but it's an Indian of Haman. <laughs> There's an Indian of Moshe. Moshe is Bittl. We need both. Huh? We need both. Yeah. Self-esteem is very, very important. Yeah, but Alter Rebbe didn't turn self-esteem into the only reality of existence. He says it's Haman Nach the Bitter. Haman Nach the Bitter is self-esteem. <laughs> what happens is because we're damaged, so we turn self-esteem into the biggest of the of the world. Because really, you don't need self-esteem; you need divine esteem. 
You need divine, you don't need self-esteem. The real self doesn't need self-esteem. The real self is looking for kayachma, for ain't self. Yeah, if you don't have self-esteem, it's dangerous. That's, that's the beauty of the maimer here, you understand? As much as he picks up self-esteem here, it's, it's, a, it's pretty sharp. It's, it's achakal haman. So I'm going to therapy all these years just to reach Haman in Kedusha. <laughs> but it's a very powerful Nakuda. Because on the other hand, if you don't have it, the whole Bittl could be one big trauma mess. It's all a fake bit nothing with Bittl. It's all Pasha, the person doesn't feel they exist, and the whole Bittl becomes another drug. You have to be careful. Because when religion becomes a drug, it's not religion anymore, it's Avaidazada. Sometimes a person serves God simply to get away from self-hate. If I somehow melt into God, it's like another relief from me. So that you're not over, out of a relationship. <laughs> it's like people who let themselves become hefker. Now, it's better than uh, some other relationships in terms of maybe things that happen. But you have to know where it's coming from. That's why he says it's so important to have this in the beginning of Avaidah. You have to be human, yeah. Because, yeah, Haman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you have Haman and Klippa. Haman and Klippa, we know who Haman and Klippa is. That's the, the Hitler complex. It's the Hitler complex where if I don't own the whole world, I don't exist. And if there's one Jew alive, I can't have Menuchas HaNefesh. That's the epitome of, of, of self in the most toxic, destructive way. For the name of my ego, I will destroy the whole world. Like the people like Napoleon, people who are ready to destroy the world for their ego. You had such people, you know, Chadnetza was that way. Titus, you know, it's called the Napoleonic complex. Dictatorships. Dictatorships, yeah, dictators, yeah. What Putin is now doing, what, what, what does he need it for? Some sugar, he could have gone down in history with a nice legacy. Build up Russia, build a big economy, yeah, make it a nice country, yeah. So what is he now going down in history is what? So he's going, why, why is he doing it? It's not Seichel. This is an example of chutzpah and gasa saruach. Something at your core is threatened. You can't even explain it to yourself. That's why you, Putin has to learn this maimer, this last piece. No, it's a very serious thing. That's where you see the I becomes the source of it. doesn't make sense. I don't care. I want. But al Rebbe says you have that in Kedusha. In Kedusha it means you don't need explanations to be a valuable person. I want, the eye has absolute value. It's what a mother gives a baby, or a father and a mother give in attachment. The mother doesn't say, you're going to be a doctor, you know what they say about the Jewish kids, right? That uh, two mothers were, were arguing from when a fetus is called viable. You know, with abortion, they always ask, when is it viable? So one mother said when he graduates medical school, and the other one when he graduates law school. That's when they're viable. So if that's the feeling, that ch- if a mother is feeling, because you're so talented and you're blonde and you have blue eyes and you're going to become a big doctor, therefore I'm going to nurse you and change your diaper. Then you're going to end up with a Haman complex. <laughs> but this sense, it's not the mother who tells you because you're a smart kid and you're a Balkishan and you're going to be a big Talmud Chachem and you're going to be the God, next God Ladar <laughs> and hopefully you'll also make a couple of dollars, therefore I'm giving you love then it's not a mother, it's not a father. This sense of attachment is unconditional. What does it tell a child? I matter. I have value. That's what attachment does. It's not das. It's not, it's not with a beard and a husband. Sometimes in yeshiva, you're accepted on condition. You're a good to eat from the eight das. Toiv vira. Sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad. That's not what a mother is for. It's not what a father is for. The hairst? It's a very thin line. And then a person can be successful. If a person has a sense of inner value, then they can have desires, they can have this. A person wants to be successful. No person essentially wakes up and says, I would love to be a loser. I would love it. I would just love to be a loser. There's something about being a loser. <laughs> I never met such a person. And if the person does say it, it's because there's something that they're feeling. Sometimes be, some, for them, being a loser is a success story. If I'm a loser, nobody has expectations. If nobody has expectations, nobody's going to insult me again. Nobody's gonna, I'll be able to survive without anybody bothering me. 
You don't put yourself up for failure. You don't put yourself up for criticism. He doesn't need his father calling him a loser again. I'm already a loser. We're good. Shengemach. Your son is a loser. He's good. You're successful. You have nachas. Huh? <laughs> but, but this is the MS. This is the MS. So, Eitzadas, yeah, when the child needs explanations why they're good, that's already an Indian of, 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 of it's, it's, something is missing. That's where Haman and Kedusha is, the I matter is an Indian of Chutzpah. But here, Chutzpah in a good way. Chutzpah, not because you have a thousand explanations why. Because that's the truth. You're a chelik Well, why, why does God matter? How much is God worth? How much is a person worth? Yeah. It's not a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. The ultimate self doesn't need self esteem. <laughs> the ultimate self is looking for oneness with infinity. The ultimate self, Moshe Rabbeinu had very good self-esteem. He didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> when he had to fight, he fought. He stood up to the whole nation. He, he fought Pada, he fought Kairach, he fought Dosen and Avidam, he fought the Meraglim. He had no issue with self-esteem. But it says he was the humblest person on earth. Because he wasn't stuck in self-esteem. Self-esteem can also be a little trap. That's what he's saying. The Kesem Malchus ultimately doesn't go to Haman. The, the person really is not looking for self-esteem. The ultimate ani is ayin. However, however, if you go to that without self-esteem, it could be dangerous. That's it. It's a very, it's a very delicate thing he's saying. You see it here in this mimer. That's why always, whenever we speak about bittol ani Hashem I always make these mentions, right? You see in this mimer what he does here. He says you need a little piece of haman in you, <laughs> haman of kedusha, not haman of. We're not talking about chutzpah. That's the Shminis Shebe Shminis. Shminis Shebe Shminis is a shtikel Haman. Mibnei Banov Shal Haman Lamdu Teire Bibnei Brak. It's a shtikel Haman. But you know what? You need it. You need that. At least in the beginning, you need it. You need that sense of, of, of chukah. And then there's a desire. There's a heart. There's a heart that feels. A heart that feels means I feel. You can't say love you without the word I. I know in text they do it. But it's not a sentence. I love you. Why? If there's no I, what is my love worth? If there's no I, what is my love worth if I don't exist? I don't value it. You don't value it. If there's no source of an emotion, what's the emotion worth? The power of love is I love you. You understand? If you feel your I is nothing, how could you value your love? And by the way, sometimes it's... It becomes very painful. If I really feel I don't exist and somebody shows love to me, how do I, how do I reciprocate it? The opposite. You know why? Because deep down I'm saying to myself, I don't really matter. I don't matter worth. So if you love me, obviously you're lying. <laughs> There's no me to love. So, so now you're a ganav. So you're actually trying to abuse me. <laughs> so I start hating you. <laughs> At least if somebody doesn't love me, they're not my enemy. You're my enemy. You're obviously trying to exploit me and manipulate me because it can't be. You understand how bad it is? That's why sometimes in such marriages, it's a disaster. One spouse is giving love and the other one, not only they can't, they can't see, say it or hear it, every time the other one gives love, it becomes even worse, the relationship. And, and the other one doesn't know what to do. Like, what should I do? I should hate you? Yeah, hate me. It's much better. <laughs> if you hate me, at least I know you're honest. Like I would say, I hate you. Oh, Baruch Hashem. Thank God you hate me. Good. Now we can be friends. Everybody else also hates me. It's a, I'm, I'm laughing. It's not so funny. It's a very, very serious wound. Because the wound comes from such a deep place. It's not based on das. It's, it's, it's before that. So this person is, 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 is trying to express affection, trying to express emotion. But the other person, it becomes a very, very difficult situation. And it becomes, sometimes you have a, a person who's really giving a lot of emotion and giving positive love. What the other person is hearing is the exact opposite. They can't hear that. There's a lot of different formations of this. I'm just giving one example how a person could respond. But, it, but, but it, it, it's this concept. Not only that, 
at least nobody else tells me they love me. When you start telling me you love me, you're going into a place that I buried long, long, long ago. I'm not going there. You're like, it's like you take a needle and you start poking, you know, a, 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 a wound. You understand? Somebody has burns on their back and you slap them on their back. Nobody tells me I love you. When this person in the marriage or somebody else says, I love you, suddenly they're looking for an emotion. That emotion <laughs> has been buried years ago. I disassociate. I'm not going there. So now this person becomes your enemy because they're threatening you. They're taking you out of your, your safety zone. So these are all elements where we have to understand that a person needs to be able to have a shminis shibba shminis. What's a shminis shibba shminis? The lave and the lamed beis nesivos work together. Samach dalet. They have to work together. The heart is the place of feeling, of, of self-consciousness, of emotion. And the chachma allows that my emotions and my heart shouldn't be stuck in my egoic mind, but it should be able to go to a place beyond ego. It should be able to go to a place of pure awareness, where there could also be pure love. You typhus? So Saman is Zaycha to bring the Sus and the Lavush, the Giluyim of Matan Taira, but the Kesa Malchus, the Kesa Malchus, that's already pure, pure oneness. That's already, that's already the Bittl of Nasev and Ishma. That already doesn't exist, Zelo Maza. Other things exist, Zelo Maza. So you have Haman and Klippi, you have Haman and Gdusha. The Kesa Malchus. Das? Well, here Das is obviously, sometimes you speak about Das in a very. You have to know the context. Here, das is basically limiting. It's the value that comes based on piseichel. You understand? And any, whenever that happens, it means that there's no core attachment. If I tell myself, I'm going to be the most successful in my office, and therefore everybody is going to love me and validate me, obviously there's something very, very painful. Because I'm proving myself. I'm living in a world where the I doesn't really have value. It doesn't have non-negotiable value. I always have to prove myself. In other words, it doesn't really exist. So instead of, because I didn't get love, so I need validation. And a person has to be able to reclaim this. So I'm going to look for validation my whole life. Some people, their whole life, they're going to be people's pleasers or they're going to uh, overachievers. But I'm always in a place of trying to numb the pain of non-existence. So if every day I can get validation, it feels good for 10 minutes. First taste? If I finish a speech and I get a standing ovation, right? Like the Bezreel is always mocked at the end of a shir to, to give me a standing ovation, right? So how long does an applause feel good? Five seconds, till it stops. Maybe it goes another minute. Then you go out, somebody says, eh, what you said the other day was apicursus. <laughs> Boom, done, broken. Next guy, oh, you changed my life. Bar Hashem, I exist. And so there's people that they go from existence to non-existence a thousand times a day. And then you come home, your wife gives you a Misha Beirach. So mamish all of our shalom, call the Heva Kadisha. Right? You go to shul, you get a compliment, yeah? Okay, Bar Hashem, I exist. Now, it's not even conscious. The person doesn't mean bad. The person is just trying to survive. A person needs to have a sense of self to survive. You need to feel you matter. If you don't feel you matter, even a mosquito needs this, by the way. <laughs> even a bee. Every, but everyone needs to feel they matter in their own way. Their own way. They need to feel they matter. A person is a tzalem alakim, so you really, you really matter. So when you feel you don't matter, it's a betrayal of God. If somebody tells me my child doesn't matter, my child is a worthless mata, it's a betrayal of me. So if somebody says about themselves or about somebody else, you don't matter, it's a betrayal of the Rebbeinah Shalala. He's a chelik alikami mal, he's might sell him alikim. Right, we even have a halacha. Kilala salikim tali, there were people who got the death penalty and they were hung. So the Torah says you have to hang them up and put them, right away bury them. Don't leave it hanging, why? Because it's a kilala salikim tali. So Rashi gives a marshal that there were two brothers, they were like twins. 
and one of them became like uh, the prince, the king, and the other one was, uh, you know, a mafiosa criminal, and he was caught, and he was hung, and everybody looked, said the king is being hung. So Rashi says, when you, when you hang a petty criminal, it's Hashem is hanging, it's a busha. So when you betray, when you betray that self, you're betraying Hashem. It's an insult to Hashem. Kilalas alikim tali. That's what Rashi says. It's kilalas alikim. Kivayachal, it's not nice. Don't, 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 don't put God on the gallows. Kivayachal. So by a person also. It's the tzalem alikim you're destroying. Tzalem alikim means there's a real sense of self, of dignity. The deepest self is, like we always say, ani oisis ayin. But you have to, that itself has to be an Indian of ani. And then there's a place where there's takai and where there's no ani, but then it's the ultimate in self. It's not, it's, not, it's not crushing. It's liberating. It's emancipating. I go out from the trap of, of ego. That's, that's the ultimate self. But then it's not a din in yeshes anymore. Huh? That's keser. That's keser, yeah. Real bittel. Real bittel doesn't need self-esteem, but not because it's afraid of self-esteem. It's not running away from it. It's, eleva- it's elevated. Yeah. Yeah. He says you can't have a void if you don't have a sense of self. But, yeah, you don't need. You don't. You don't want it to become a trap. You don't want it to become a, a limited, a, a limiting thing. It's like if, if I'm busy a whole day saying, "Do I have self-esteem?" I don't have self-esteem. You know that itself is. When a person has real self-esteem, they can give it up too. <laughs> yeah, they can give it up too. When you own, uh, here is how it is. When you own something, how do you know you own something? You can give it away, right? I could be in a shul for 20 years. I don't own the shul because I can't give it. How do you know you own something? You can give it away. How do you know you own self-esteem? You can give it away. <laughs> if you own it, you can give it away. If you own your self-esteem, you can give it away. There was an artist, Picasso, so he once said, the purpose of life, uh, the... the, the I forgot, it's a good line, but something like the goal of life is to find your purpose and the ultimate purpose of life is to give it away or something. <laughs> the point is, when you own something, yeah, if I own $1,000, I can give it away. If I'm always borrowing your car, <laughs> I can't give it away. So I'm saying when you could give something, it's because you really have it. Okay. Everybody have a freilich and put them, huh? Guilt can destroy self-esteem, absolutely. Especially the guilt of parents. <laughs> the guilt for Yiddish Amamas and Yiddish Huh? The Jewish guilt. But I think guilt also comes sometimes. Guilt could be, guilt can also be, again, guilt could be clip and guilt could be Kedusha. When the guilt causes me just to wallow in pain and self-pity, and I'm just such a miserable person, and I ruined everybody's lives, then it's a continuation of that element of not realizing a person's value. If the guilt is, okay, I made a mistake, and now I know what my mistake is, and I want to do whatever I can to repair it as much as I can, I can't repair everything, then the guilt brings a new life. That's what tshuva is. Well, Rebbe says in Tanya Peter Klamadal, there's two words in Hebrew, atzvus and meridus. He says, don't confuse the two. Atzvus is uh, like a sadness, a heavy, sluggish depression. Meridus is a frustration, a, a, a realization. It's a pain that wakes me up. Atzvus, I say, let me go to sleep. Meridus, I say, let me wake up. Yeah, it's a, there's a drive. Yeah, there's a pain there. Exactly. There's a disappointment. There's a frustration. Um, there's grief. There's grief. But the grief leads me, you know... Let me, let me try. What, what could I do? And there's always a lot people can do, you know. People's relationships with their children don't end when they're 19. You know, you'd be surprised. You can have a child who's 50 years old, 60 years old, and a, a mother calls up, a father calls up, and says something really special to them. It means the world to them. People don't realize. Just because you're 60 and you already have, you know, your own grandkids, it doesn't mean you don't need a father and a mother to give you validation and, and love. It's very powerful. People don't realize this. 
They think, you know, I, I ruined my kids. Now that my kid is 40, 50, 60, 70. So Nishta Zayposh, kids remain kids. They say that uh, Rav Cook, his mother's funeral, she passed away. She was an old lady. Rabbi Avram Yitzchak HaKoyim Cook. And he was sobbing. And so somebody asked him, you know, obviously it was very sad, but, you know, she was a very, she was quite an elderly woman and she had a riches yamim. So he said, nobody is ever going to call me again Avram Allah. You know, Rav Cook was a controversial figure. Ravram Yitzchak HaKoyim Cook said, nobody ever is going to call me again Avram Allah. Huh? It was a certain innocence, you understand, a certain a certain security that uh, he knew it's, you don't get it in the world. Allah's al Habana Freilich and Purim, and what we learned here, Freilich and Matan Taira, and the Pchin of Adelayad, to be able to go beyond uh, Eitz Sadas. Bezer Hashem, tomorrow we'll have a Fabreng in here. Tuesday evening at 8. Where? Right here. They're going to set up with food and music, and uh, everybody's invited after the Suda. To bring your children or your friends, anybody you want. I wasn't expecting the Rav to, uh, to open up that can of worms at the end. Which one? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> that love and not being loved. And the oh. We need this can for a long time. <laughs> Only when you open the can of worms can you open the cans, all the other cans. Huh? Year and years ago, I used to listen to about whatever. It's all, I guess, it's all important. Napcho. When you say that Haman didn't want to have Kesser or didn't have Shaka together, he said that he wanted to all three things, right? No, he wanted, but Lapoil he couldn't get the Kesser. But he, he couldn't get any of this. Get no, but at least, but the other ones he took and he gave it to Mardechai. He became a conduit. No, Kesser was no. The Kesser wasn't given. Yeah. Right, without a Kesser. No. The other things Haman took and put it on Mardechai, and he's the one who gave it all to Mardechai. He led him on the horse and he put on the garments. She had her crown, the queen's crown. Yeah. But Lepoyal Haman never got the Kesser to give to Mardechai. Yeah. So the Rebbe says, because that Nikudda you don't have in Zelu Umazah. Right. It says the Keser, the Indian of, 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 of Levush and Sus, you have in Zelu Umazah. You can have it in Klippi, you can have it in Kedusha. Geus, you have the Chutzpah of Haman, and you have the exaltedness in Kedusha, which is also the idea of Haman after the Birur. But in the Kudda of Keser over there, there's no competition, there's no Zelu Umazah. Right, that's what it is. It's the Ratzon. The pure, it's the pure oneness. There's no counterfeit. There's no counter. Everything else has a counterfeit. Confidence is counterfeit. Love, everything, wisdom. You can have brilliant wisdom, but it's fake. It's counterfeit wisdom. It's using the logic to, to be manipulate to be manipulative. Yeah. Every quality has zelu umaza. Yechidish abenefesh bittel. The Nekud of Bittl is no Zalom what, what, What's Bittl and Klippah? <laughs> the Nekud of Bittl. Not fake, fake humility. When, when did the Esther's letter pass away to, to the soldiers? Chav Gimel Sivan. It says Chav Gimel Sivan. The second letters came that the Jews can do whatever they want to defend themselves. Yeah. Well, Esther already got the agreement. But Chav Gimel Sivan, they sent out all the Achash Darpanim, all the emissaries, with the new letters to all the regions of Achashvedish, letting everybody know. In Shushan, they already knew before. So basically, they could carry the weapons. And they could carry weapons. They could do whatever they want to their enemies. Free reign. The king gives them full permission. It gave them the confidence to be able to defend themselves any way they want. And that's what they did. 
permission to carry and permission to fight back and permission to, uh, to take a stand, not to surrender. Why don't we do anything? Who trained the Jews? Oh. Well, they had from Nissan till other to train. Why don't we do anything? It says in Shulchan Aruch that the second day of Pesach you should add something to the meal as a zecher for the mishta of Esther that she made for Achashverosh. The party where she, where she got Haman to be executed, that was on Pesach. So it says in Shulchan Aruch that there's a minik to do something extra, to eat something extra at the party, at the, at the sud of the second day of Pesach, zecher for the Esther's, uh, for the mishta of Esther. We do everything like the food that is, you know? Huh? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 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 <laughs>